As a CIA asset, Susan Lindauer covered anti-terrorism at the Iraqi embassy in New York from 1996 up to the U.S. invasion in 2003. She gave advance warning of the events of September 11, 2001. Shortly after requesting to testify before Congress about pre-war intelligence, Susan became one of the first victims of the USA Patriot Act. She was accused under a secret indictment, convicted as a result of secret evidence, and imprisoned for a year without a trial or hearing. After five years of indictment without a conviction or guilty plea, the Injustice Department dismissed all charges five days before Obama's inauguration. Susan is the author of Extreme Prejudice, the terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 and Iraq, in which she tells of her experiences. Susan Lindauer, welcome to the Global Freedom Report. I'm delighted to be on. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and My story is scary, yeah, and, well, and it's a real spy thriller. I'll tell you, it's a real-life spy thriller. Well, now, let's talk spy for a moment here. What does it mean to cover anti-terrorism? I mean, what was your basic job description when you worked in New York? I was uh, uh, a back channel to Libya and Iraq during the 1990s sanctions. When both of those governments were pariah nations, they were in total international isolation. And um, it, from the United States, from, from the American standpoint, it was a covert exercise because um, the Iraqis and the Libyan governments knew that I was a CIA asset. And, of course, the CIA knew it, too. But um, ordinary people, it was kept out of the media. Uh, they did not tell the American people what was going on. However, it was recognized that those governments, that the United States had to keep an eye on terrorism, and those governments would have a lot to contribute. And I was anti-sanctions, so I was I was excited to do it. But we, but but Saddam's government was one of our best sources on anti-terrorism throughout the 90s. Okay, now. Up until you became embroiled in the politics surrounding the events of September 11, 2001, was your life as an intelligence asset adventurous and exciting, dull and boring, crap routine, <laughs> maybe a little bit of each? You know, well, I mean, every one of us, every one of us <laughs> thinks James Bond when we think spies. So I just before yeah. before September 11th and the events of that fateful I, day, I met Osama bin Laden. <laughs> yeah. Back in 1986, we did really my my. It was it was a little bit of both. It was it was very adventurous. Um, it, it was it was dangerous. I mean, I've had people uh, try to assassinate me before. Um, truly, um, I've had uh, the Syrians put a contract out on me. I, I had a uh, a boyfriend, a lover, ooh, who was an arms trader for Gaddafi. Uh, who then went back and, and uh, put a contract out on my life through one of the Colombian drug cartels. <laughs> I'm not making this up. My life in many respects is signed, a spy has, movie. <laughs> has anybody been signed to do the movie? That was my question. <laughs> I mean, I, I had some, I've had some very uh, extraordinary moments, but also some very, you know, some dull, you know, it's not that it's dull, but there are times when, when everything is quiet and calm and you know you're just you're you're kind of running your trap lines on at the United Nations because I live in I live in the Washington area Washington D.C. area and I would I would go up to New York to visit my my diplomatic contacts and I would go see the Libyans and I'd go see the Iraqis and also I was connected into Syria and Yemen and Hezbollah and Malaysia. And so I was meeting lots of different embassies and diplomats on the Security Council. So it was very exciting. And I always knew everything that was going on before anybody else. And that was my job, was to make sure that we kept track of everything that was happening. Um, but there would be, but there were often visits that were just, you know, very friendly, but, but, you know, nothing was happening because there was no terrorism to report. Or, okay, but, no, that, but, that, but on the other hand, at times it got very exciting. Yeah, that, that, Osama bin Laden and then Gaddafi's. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. You know, we can we can relate. Um, yeah. Can you briefly? I dealt with Gaddafi and Saddam. I dealt with Gaddafi and Saddam. Did you, um, they did, knew. Did, did they you, knew personally who I was. Did you ever? They, meet they had to approve it. No, I did not. 
but they had to approve my relations with the embassy. Um, it was that high level that the embassy could not have dealt with me without the permission of those individuals. So this That's, was not low-level contact. Okay, and that just gives us a little bit of background. Now, can you briefly take us through the general timeline of events from when you first acquired intel of interest to the point where you were indicted? <laughs> sure, yes. My story is the cover-up of 9-11 and Iraq. Uh, and the story that you have been told is entirely a lie. There's not a single word of what they told you that's true. Um, I first learned about 9-11 from my own CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse. And he told me in April and May of 2001 that he had a message that he wanted, the CIA wanted to communicate to the Iraqi government through my back channel. And that's what I existed to do. So I was happy to comply. This did not surprise me. I knew they, 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 ex the Iraqis, when I came and delivered the message, they expected to receive this kind of communication and they had channels in Baghdad that would automatically receive any information that I gave and they would deliver messages right back. So I did the 9-11 investigation with covering Iraq as well. And, but the first message was in April of 2001, the CIA was demanding that Iraq must hand over actionable intelligence on any conspiracy involving airplane hijackings. And this was extended to, um, uh, th this, this was expanded to include the World Trade Center, a strike on the World Trade Center by about June. But the first message was, if Iraq has any information about airplane hijackings, then we expect them to pass that through to our Back through the back channel, and if they fail to do so, and it is discovered that they possess the information and refuse to give it to us or fail to give it to us, then the United States would go to war with Iraq. Now, this was in April of 2001, and I went up to New York, and we had been dealing on a, you'll find, again, more information than you've ever imagined. The lies are bigger than you know. Um, there, we were already negotiating a comprehensive peace framework with the Iraqi government, and Iraq had already agreed to allow the FBI to come into Baghdad and to set up a ter terrorism task force because Saddam wanted to cooperate to the, recognize that, that his cooperation with anti-terrorism was a strength of Baghdad. And so he said, send in the FBI. When we said to him, we're threatening you with, with war if you don't provide this intelligence, the Iraqis responded, hey, send the FBI into Baghdad. Go ahead. We've already agreed to this. We're just waiting for the FBI to show up. Send them in. <laughs> and and I went back to, to uh, Washington, and I told my the CIA handler, and he said, I didn't tell you to be nice to those people. I told you to tell those blankety-blank, SOB blankety-blanks, that we're going to war with these people if they don't do this. And I want you to go back to New York, and I want you to deliver the message exactly as I gave it to you. And I said, but Richard, they've already agreed to have the FBI come in. He said, I don't care. You go and you tell them the threat of war in the response to airplane hijacking, specifically airplane hijacking. The wait, threat wait, of wait, war. A, wait a moment, Susan. You're telling me that the objective... <laughs> it's, a whole, it's shocking, isn't wait, it? So the objective was not to get them to agree. The objective was to lay the foundation for a war. Exactly. But I didn't know that at the time. I was, at the time... Um, what you'll find in it, when you read my book, Extreme Prejudice, we were working on a comprehensive peace framework. We had an amazing, it included weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, including getting the FBI into Baghdad. After 9-11, the Iraqis tried to give us a valuable intelligence cache of financial documents on al-Qaeda figures, which would have shown where the money was being held. Where is Al-Qaeda hiding its money? We would have been able to seize, the FBI would have been able to seize those bank accounts and seize all of Al-Qaeda's money. But the, but the Bush administration refused to take it. We also had Iraq, Iraq's agreement to have, um, give the United States preferential contracts on oil, uh, 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 telecommunications, healthcare, hospital equipment, pharmaceuticals, non-dual-use 
factory equipment, and transportation. Iraq offered to buy one million American manufactured automobiles every year for 10 years. We had an incredible system laid out. We, the Iraqis were, were okay, well, now, the okay. CIA was shameless. Okay, we, so, were, we were demanding everything. All right, so <laughs> let, now move us along on this. I mean, I, I okay. wish I had a three-hour show. I know, I know, I'm going. sorry. And well, the, well way, the thing can, is... Can you, stay, can you stay for one more segment? Oh, absolutely. I'd okay. love to. That, that's uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. But I'd love for you to stay for one more segment because we're not going to get anywhere through near. Yeah, I'm I, sorry. It, it, the book is Extreme Prejudice, the Terrifying Story of the Patriot Act and the Cover-Ups of 9-11 in Iraq. We knew about 9-11 as an airplane hijacking conspiracy and a strike on the World Trade Center by May, April, May, and June of 2001. And what I believe happened is that this, this, the American government of uh, a, a an orphan team, a a they they had already decided to go to war with Iraq, and so they allowed they did two two things happen. One, they they allowed the hijackings to go on, and they allowed they stepped down the actions that would have would have been in play to stop the attack were not taken. But then they did something else. They used night the the airplane hijackings as a cover for the controlled demolition of the buildings because they'd already decided to go to war with Iraq. And so the two things are not mutually exclusive. And this is a correction that I must insist upon for the 9-11 truth community. I love you guys. I know you get really concerned when I start talking about airplane hijack. Yes, I know that the demolitions occurred. However, they used the airplane hijackings as a cover so that everybody's attention would be on the airplanes. They need, they had to have the airplane hijacked in order to have the demolition. There had to be an excuse to demolish the buildings. There had, to, it's like a magician's trick. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, what, sorry. why demolish the building? Well, they had all, the good question. In other words, in other words, um, they, had, the they had already to, decided yeah. to go to war with Iraq and they had to make sure that the damage would be so profound and they would, they would be able to maximize destruction of the attack, in the attack. Otherwise, they would not be able to persuade the American people to accept 9-11. So, so what Excuse you're saying me, to is, accept the war. So Sorry. what you're saying is that the, the hijacking and the demolition were both parts of a tapestry whose objective was to get us into war with Iraq. Exactly. And they had decided that uh, they had decided the outcome, which was the war with Iraq, months before 9-11 happened. I was heartbroken. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I couldn't believe they were doing it because, you know, the Iraqis kept, you know, we kept pounding them all summer long saying, you know, do you have any intelligence? You know, the Americans are threatening war if you don't provide this intelligence to us. And the Iraqis kept saying over and over again, we have nothing. We don't know anything. You're the ones who know this is going to happen. You know, and I will tell you, Iraq's response after 9-11, and I had the response. I was the one who sat down with the diplomats at the embassy. They were like, Susan, Susan, you are, you knew this was going to happen. You kept telling about this, telling us about this attack for months. Why didn't you stop it? You didn't stop it because you knew all along that you were going to go to war with us and you wanted an excuse. And so you stood back and you allowed your own people to die because you wanted an excuse to attack Baghdad. They said you should be begging God for forgiveness. Uh, Don't you bask Saddam Hussein to, to apologize to you for this horror. You did this to your own country and you should beg God for mercy and forgiveness. And he said, frankly, I don't think you're ever going to get it. I don't think that God will ever absolve you from this crime. Now, how did that feel? <laughs> how did that feel, hearing that? Oh, my heavens. Listen, um, I my first contact, thanks to the Patriot Act, we have uh, 28,000 phone pardon, calls. Pardon me, pardon me. I don't allow it to be called the Patriot Act because that lets people think it's patriotic. It is the USA yes. Patriot Act. And I always go out of my way to say it that Thank way you. to remind people that it's just an acronym. That's right. It is It is an acronym. It is an offense to all of the Constitution. And I would love to come back and talk about that just oh, by itself. Oh, we'll do it. We'll do it. It's a day. 
It's a date. It's a date because you don't even. I mean, no offense, but your listeners are would be horrified. I got hit with all the bells and whistles of the Patriot Act. But let me just tell you that this that, that the Iraqis when the Iraqis said this to me, they were right. I was devastated. I had my first meeting at the Iraqi embassy was on September 18th. Okay. So September 11th is the attack. One week later, I'm up at the Iraqi embassy. I'm there on the 18th, and then I go back on the 22nd. Because I was the back channel, I pushed the Iraqis very hard. I said, you have got to give me a response from Baghdad. I have to be able to give something to the CIA. So on the the phone records show that on the night of the 21st, um, the the – Iraqi diplomats called me and told me to come back to New York, and I did go back on the 22nd. So uh, on the 18th and the 22nd, I am the one in direct contact. That is my job. That is not like a, that is that is not unusual. That is what I existed to do. And if I had refused to help in the 9/11 investigation, I would have been a traitor well, to now, me, in my now, opinion. Yet I was indicted. Well, this is yeah, I this was is what, indicted now, I'm, I'm as an Iraqi agent for so, seeking Iraq's cooperation. So yeah, I'm confused with the timeline. What was you met with Iraq after the events of September 11th, which means oh, before and after. I met with Iraq. Uh, but, I had been I had been meeting with the Iraqis for years. But you hadn't so been before, you hadn't been indicted. You hadn't been arrested before. Before September 11th. No, that's correct. Okay. You're, you're correct. But, I but was indicted have... in I was indicted in March of 2004, after I requested to testify before the 9/11 Commission and a brand new blue ribbon uh, presidential commission on Iraqi pre-war intelligence. So that's and I called what the triggered... offices. That's what triggered it when okay. I requested See, I... permission to testify. I, that's I... when they came and arrested me. Yeah, my confusion was that I thought that what triggered it was the fact that you were ripped. Reporting intel in advance of the event. It wasn't. Oh well, that they, they, that's true too. I mean, the, the whole reason they the good question. The whole reason they inv- indicted me was so that I would not be able to expose that I had given advance warning about 9/11, and that my team was involved in the 9/11 warnings, and that the government had full knowledge of 9/11 for months. So when not, when Congress realized that I was going to talk and I was going to tell what they did, uh, that we had this information, then they came and arrested me. Think how terrible and corrupt that is. Now, and it shows that it's a deliberate conspiracy to, to, to deceive the American people. Now, this is so not an accident that they made a mistake. This is deliberate deception. Now, Susan, okay, because I, I know, you know, in your book, are all the details of what happened. But what I want to know, I'm, I, and yes, there are people who are outraged at the, the way the American people have been abused by this type of stuff. But I want to know how it felt to you experiencing the government you had served depriving you oh. of the very liberty you sought to preserve as a member of that same government and doing so without due process and outside the rule of law. How did you feel I felt like I had been, I I felt, I, 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 it was the most extraordinary betrayal. I was devastated. I was not ashamed. I always was ready to stand in front of a jury of my peers and tell them what I had done. And if the United States government thought I broke, broke the law, then I believe in the rule of law. And so if you think I broke the law, then you have the right to convict me. <laughs> but you do not ever have the right to deprive me of a trial. I was thrown in prison on a Texas military base, insulted and degraded. Um, I was outraged, furious. Um, I was also terrified because, like today, I just, today... I had a conversation with my a legislative staffer for my own member of Congress, Chris Van Hollen, who's part of the Democratic leadership. And he said to me, and I couldn't believe this, he said, well, of course we wouldn't let you have a trial. Huh, you, got, you got that right. We weren't going to let you have a trial. And, and you see, the people, ordinary Americans and, and international community, think to themselves, this is a horrible thing that they've done. They throw this woman in prison so that they can deceive the entire public. And and you're thinking to yourself, well, this is just George Bush that did it, or this is just the Republican Party that did it. My friend, the entire government, even my own congressman, 
who is a liberal Democrat. He is a progressive Democrat. And they're like, oh, no, we don't have to tell the truth to the American people. You, we're going we're gonna to hold on to our office. We don't care what they have to say. And he, they, 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 they scorn me as much as you res- may respect me. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, I'm furious. I'm outraged. And, and, you know, did you ever think by and the way? And this is today that he said that. He said, well, we don't care if you didn't have a trial. Of course we weren't going to give you a trial. <laughs> like I was some idiot for thinking that I had, had, had some rights. This is a government that I, this is a country that I had defended and protected and loved. I love being an asset. It was the best thing I ever did in my life. I was proud to serve my country, and I felt, and I was, I was like, where did, where did my, where did America go? <laughs> what, what happened to the United States of America? And you where, ask, where am I now? And you asked the right question. My guest is Susan Lindauer. She's a former CIA agent or intelligence asset, as they refer to themselves, and uh, she has led something of a James Bondian life, <laughs> and. Um, the reason she's here today is to talk to you about what happened with 911 on September 11, 2001. That whole fiasco. Um, she had provided information in advance of the event, and years later, she was going to testify before Congress. A no-no, apparently. They decided that they would indict her. Uh, they decided that they would imprison her. No trial. No arraignment. No charges. For a year. Now, what was it like? What was, I mean, what kind of a, were you in like a, a federal country okay. club or, I mean, what? <laughs> I was in prison on, uh, at a, at a, at Carswell Federal Medical Center on Carswell Air Force Base. And it was very significant. Car, it, it was a, it is a, it is a full scale prison. Um, but I was, this was very, very, very dangerous. Uh, my book describes, the first half of my book describes Iraqi pre-war intelligence, the 9-11 investigation, the Iraqi peace framework, a whole bunch of things you don't even know existed. It's like, a, it's a huge encyclopedia, except it's a spy thriller. This is not an academic book. The second half of my book takes readers into the prison on Carswell Air Force Base. And it was very frightening because what happened was I was indicted so that I could not tell the truth about Iraq and 9-11 and anti-terrorism and the fraud of the war on terrorism. Uh, there's a lot of fraud that you don't even know about either, that, that, that um, it's bankrupting our country. This is not ancient history. This is affecting what's happening to us right now. Okay, so they decided they were going to erase the truth. So what happened was, right after my arrest, I do know that the the FBI interviewed my CIA handler and my defense intelligence handler, and they confirmed that I had, they told the FBI that I had warned about 9-11. That means that the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the Justice Department Attorney General's Office were all aware of the 9-11 warnings six months before the 9-11 Commission report was out. And I agreed... I offered, not agreed, I offered, I tried to waive my rights, my Fifth Amendment rights. For those of you who are in America, you know the Fifth Amendment is the right not to incriminate yourself, and you're not required right. to speak you're, outside you're, the presence you're, of an you're attorney. You're speaking to a very knowledgeable listening audience okay. on this okay, show. Okay, sorry, sorry, no good. Words. Okay, I figured, I figured, but I just wanted to make sure, because I wanted people to know that after, nine, after my arrest, I still offered to waive my Fifth Amendment right so that I could testify at the 9-11 Commission. And once my, uh, the, once the FBI had interviewed my CIA handler and defense intelligence handler, they knew about the 9-11 warning, so there was no pretending anymore. This was six months before the Commission report. There was plenty of time. Now, uh, in September of 2004, uh, again, before the Commission report, the FBI makes a very important discovery. It's not only the, C- the intelligence community that knows about the 9-11 warnings. I had told members of my, my, my very close friends who had family and friends in New York that they should stay out of New York because of this attack. 
And so the CIA realized that this was out of the bounds. This was into the end. Um, we call them civilians. The civilian public knew about it, too. And now the FBI had confirmation from them. So at this point, I get sent to prison on a military base because the, 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 the government decides that the way they're going to handle me and shut me up so that no one will know what's happening is that they're going to say that I was incompetent. Yeah, I warned about 9-11, but I'm incompetent. I correctly tell members of Congress the consequences of war in Iraq and how it's going to be a catastrophe. The occupation will be a disaster. It's going to cost a couple trillion dollars um, to fight this thing. It's going to bankrupt the Americans, but I am incompetent. And so what happens is there starts to be this group think on Capitol Hill, and they're trying to figure out how do they save their jobs. And it's very important to know that these are not just accidental mistakes. They are fully knowledgeable that they are engaged in an active deception and fraud of the American people. Well, this now, is not now, like a mistake. This is not a mistake. And, and this we've is got a that. choice. And we've got that. And Sorry. We got that. Sorry. But, it's but, a choice. But, but we got off on a tangent here because, see, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to how this personally affected you. Understand, we talk about, you know, we talk about the fraud that is the story of 9-11, though I think you have added some elements into what I know, yes. and I know quite a bit. Um, no, sure and we do. do that yeah. on this show all the time. But what I sure. want to do is I want to get inside you on this. Considering sure. that all well, these cons well, considering all these conspirators, okay, understood why you were being put away. How were you treated? Did they say give it, make it cushy for her because she hasn't really done anything wrong, even though we want her out of the way? Or did they say, you know, let's set an example with this one so nobody else tries to cross us? Or you know. What was Very, it like? That is exactly what they did. They made this, it, it was the most, uh, I am very difficult to scare. I work with anti-terrorism, and so I have, I've met arms trade. I dated a couple of arms traders. I've met terrorists before. I've worked close up with people who want to kill other human beings. I have never been so frightened in my entire life as I was when I was locked up in prison on that Texas military base. Because once I got in, ostensibly, you'll find it in my book, Extreme Prejudice, they said that they wanted me to go in for a psychiatric evaluation to see if I was competent to stand trial. And, of course, it lined up beautifully with their political perspective on in Capitol Hill that assets were incompetent. We were to blame for not finding out about 9-11. We were to blame for the failure of pre-war intelligence. And since I was an asset, therefore, I was incompetent, and it was all politics. But once I get in there, the government, the Justice Department fought dirty. They tried, uh, the book is called Extreme Prejudice for a reason. They tried to hold me for up to 10 years without a trial. They actually petitioned the court for the right to hold me indefinitely and to forcibly drug me with Haldol, Ativan oh and Prozac. Oh my God. Because they said that I, even though they knew that I was telling the truth. Were you, how did, about, you have, did you have some kind of representation? <laughs> I had a public defender who did nothing. But they, he was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And my uncle, who is an attorney, a brilliant, wonderful, devoted, ferocious attorney, this beloved man would drive 700 miles. I think that's like a 1,000 kilometers if you've got some Europeans out there. a 1,000 kilometers, 700 miles in each direction to come visit me, and they would refuse to let him come onto the military base and refuse to let him enter the prison. So I was not allowed to see an attorney. Try to imagine that. Here I am. I'm locked up in prison. They are trying to hold me for 10 years without a trial or a hearing, and I am not allowed to see an attorney. This is pretty I terrifying. was scared to death. So, and they tried to, and the, and the women at Carswell who I saw who were doped up with Haldol, Haldol is worse than Thorazine. Haldol is a rhinoceros tranquilizer. Yeah. If you're doped up, you cannot speak, yeah. you cannot read, you cannot write, you cannot hold a fork to eat your food, you cannot drink. If you people wet their beds 
grown women, and they tend to be in their 20s and 30s. They're not 70 or 80 years old. They're young. They're young people, but they cannot, they wet their beds at night. They, uh, no, they, it's, they, it's very, they it's, cannot it's, wash yeah, themselves. It completely destroys your, your sense of yourself and everything. Absolutely. Yes. No question. But they, they did release yes. you in a year. Well, what happened was I, they, they tried to force, they, I never, I have to be clear on this point because I get asked a lot. I never used any drugs. I, when I, when I heard this, I put up a fight. And, of course, I am a tough, uh, believe me when I say, I'm a tough fighter. I didn't just roll over on them. When they said, we refuse to give you a trial, I said, well, you're violating the Constitution. <laughs> I know my rights. I've read the Constitution. I've read the law. You know, thank heavens for the law library at the prison. I've read the statute. You're in violation of everything. And so I petitioned, um, I, I filed pro se with my uncle, who is an attorney, and we fought to have my to gain my release. And then I have to tell you, it was because of internet radio. Truly, this is not an exaggeration. I'm not being polite to you guys. What happened was my beloved sweet companion who has died. He's a wonderful man, J.B. Fields, and I loved this man. He fought for me. I could not speak at all because I was locked up in prison on the military base. I was I was completely incommunicado. My attorney could not visit me. My uncle could not visit me. Okay. J.B. Fields went out to Internet Radio, and he started doing radio interviews, desperately trying to get attention for my case because the Washington Post, the New York Times, refused to touch this. No Associated Press was like, they would only print what the White House and the Justice Department said to them. And so they were totally in collusion with the cover-up of 9-11 in Iraq. And they were willing, they, the White House, the, the, the corporate media totally, pardon me, screwed America. And they knew they were doing it. I mean, my boyfriend, my beloved, wonderful J.B. Field, would contact Amy Goodman and say, Susan warned about 9-11. We will put you on. You can interview her witness. You can interview the Scottish attorneys from the Lockerbie case who are willing to testify that they know she was a CIA asset. And we can prove this to you. And Amy Goodman would say, oh, she said this apparently. Oh, well, I think her attorney thinks this is for the best, so I guess we better do what her attorney says. It was the only time that I've ever heard, seen my boyfriend cry. And he was a loving, wonderful man. But you know how men just don't cry. They don't. And he was Excuse a military me. guy. Excuse me. Well, he was a military that. guy. He was a military guy. And he just, he was like tough. He was a tough old guy. And he broke down. He said, I can't believe that even Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! will not cover your story, and Pat Godfrey is ready to talk to her on the phone any minute, who, my witness on the on the 9-11 stuff. They, the corporate media absolutely shut down this story. And, and so, it wasn't just that they were shutting down my arrest. They were shutting down the truth about 9-11, the truth okay, about, gotta, ni about I, Iraq. I've got to cut okay. you off because we're going to completely okay, run out of time. Sorry. I want to have time. I loved coming on your show. I'd love to come back. And I'd love to have you come back, but I want to I do as much to complete this particular topic as possible. So here I need some quick answers. To, sure. Firstly, you were let out after a year, but they kept you under indictment for five years. How does that work? Yes. Uh, they said that uh, it, it was dirty as hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, when they, they 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 said I was incompetent to stand trial, and I said, okay, drop the charges. And they said, hmm, no, we're not going to do that. And then they kept trying to send me back to prison. So uh, for a good year and a half, every I would be hauled up to New York every single month, and the prosecutor would argue that I should be sent back to prison. And um, the only thing that stopped me from going back was that after my release from prison, I had a, br I got a, within two weeks, <laughs> I got a brand new, fabulous, outstanding, internationally re recognized attorney who took my case almost pro bono. He, there was a cost, but compared to the, what he gave me, it was nothing. And, and it was just, he wanted the, the, the challenge of the case and he believed that a tremendous injustice had been done. And he was committed to getting the story out about 9-11 in Iraq. And he said, this is just, we cannot allow the Justice Department 
to go down the road. He he was capable of beating the Patriot Act, is, and is he, he was the, interested is, in the challenge is of he, the Patriot is, Act. Is he the reason the Injustice Department dismissed the charges? Yes, yes. He finally, after four years of indictment and half a dozen psychiatric evaluations saying there was nothing wrong with me, you got to realize the psychiatrists are weighing in, too. And they're like, there's nothing no. wrong with this woman. No. There is no, there's no delusions. There's no, stop. there's no. I want to stop Sorry. you there. I want to give out the okay. contact information, make sure people have the opportunity to get the book, because that has the answers to, that would go on for a long time that we don't have. Right oh, yeah. So. It's, yeah, it's Extreme Prejudice, the terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 in Iraq. It is a, a real-life spy thriller. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com, and and I hope and it's on Kindle. I hope that you will read it. Uh, it is not an academic book. It is a personal narrative of what I actually suffered, and it takes you into the Iraqi embassy and into prison on a Texas military base, and you will not be able to sleep at night. <laughs> you will be, and you'll see the Patriot Act in a totally new way. And we're going to bring you back to do, to talk about exactly that. And uh, you also have a blog out at extremeprejudiceusa.wordpress.com. And this yes. slogan over there, it says, when truth becomes treason. Yes. And uh, That's it. I, I look forward to having you back. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And I'm sorry I had to keep cutting you off, but I wanted to get That's okay. Of- That's all right. I'd love to come back, and and I just want to say that um, that, that the, the 9/11 is not over because even though you know it happened 10 years ago, the consequences are going on today. We were bankrupting our middle class to pay for this war on terrorism. All right, Susan, thanks so much. We will have you back. We'll have you back very, very soon. Thank you.